All right, it is six o'clock, so I want to take this time uh, to thank you all for joining this webinar tonight. Uh, tonight's conversation is called Engaging the Text. Uh, it was originally designed for prospective students, but alumni are our number one influencers uh, for, for who chooses to apply and attend to Wesley Theological Seminary. So we are so delighted to have a whole crowd of alumni, current students, and friends of Wesley gathered with our prospective students tonight. Uh, will you pray with me? Holy One, we give thanks for the opportunity to come together tonight. We give thanks for your divine inspiration that led to the holy text and that influences each and every one of us every day as we do holy deeds. Be with us tonight, God. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> So I'm going to invite my recruiting partner, Elijah Farabee. I am Elizabeth Krunicki, and Elijah and I are both recruiters in the Office of Admissions. I'm going to invite Elijah to introduce our guests tonight, who um, are already pretty famous to a, a number of us on this call. Yes. So, well, welcome again, everyone. A lot of you know me. Um, it's good to see many of you. My name is Elijah Farabee. I am a recruiter for the Office of Admissions, Liz just said, um, and I have been given the honorable duty to introduce our wonderful guest this evening. Um, I was speaking with a couple of friends earlier about something from Instagram culture called standing. And uh, it's a phrase that we like to use called we stand so and so. So this evening we get, we get to stand theological divas, theological queens, renowned theologians, uh, Dr. Denise Hopkins and Dr. Carla Works. Um, a little bit about Dr. Hopkins is she is our professor, um, actually our Woodrow Wilson and Mildred B. Miller Professor of Biblical Theology. And she teaches our Hebrew, she is one of our Hebrew Bible professors. So Hebrew Bible one, Hebrew Bible two, the actual Hebrew language, um, and an assortment of other courses in our uh, human program as well. And it is a pleasure to have her here this evening. Um, as you know, because many of you have had her as a professor, um, she has written and, and contributed to a, a bunch of, of books um, and, and articles. Um, a couple to name are Journey Through the Psalms, um, bring, Bridging the Divide Between Bible and Practical Theology um, with our professor of pastoral care and counseling, Michael Koppel, and um, an array of other books that we encourage you to look into um, and order uh, and use as some type, use as a reference for, for work as you are continuing to unpack theology. Um, our other guest, our second guest for this evening is Dr. Carla Burks, um, who is our associate professor in New Testament. Um, many of you have had her, many of you know her, many of you love, love both of these awesome professors. Um, and recently Dr. Burks is, I'm sorry, Dr. Burks is actually our professor in New Testament. Um, let me get that correct. Uh, she actually recently also released a book um, entitled The Least of These, Paul and the Marginalized, which was, which was um, available January 16th, uh, 2020 this year. Um, so check that out. It's a phenomenal work. They are wonderful, and we are so happy to have them here. Dr. Works also teaches an assortment of New Testament courses as well, um, a couple including New Testament 1, New Testament 2, um, and uh, different, again, different courses in New Testament that we encourage you all to check out. Um, if you are alumni, to jump back in and audit and invite more people to, to uh, jump back in and do as well. Um, and at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, my colleague and coworker, Liz. Thanks, Elijah. So we are going to jump right in here. We have a, a, tight, we have a tight schedule because um, I know that we have a lot of questions and we're going to have a good conversation. Um, so everyone <laughs> is muted except for Dr. Works, Dr. Hopkins, um, and then at some times me and Elijah. So if you would like to ask a question, please put it in the chat box. We have a few questions already lined up. Uh, some of you submitted some questions on Facebook and then we had some questions we wanted to address as well. Um, so depending on how much time we have after the first three questions, we'll be taking questions from the group. So feel free to throw questions in the chat box, either message them to me or to, to everyone. Um, and we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll be able to get to a few of those. Uh, so with no further ado, um, let's dive in. Our first question uh, to Dr. Hopkins and Dr. Works in whichever order <laughs> is, what is it that we think we are doing when we interpret the biblical text? Go for it, Denise. Carla with a statement. Let's do that. I printed it okay. out. Do you want to introduce it? Go ahead, go ahead. 
Uh, Carla and I talked about this time together. We're very excited about it. And fortuitously, yesterday, the Society of Biblical Literature, which is our professional society, and which contains 8,300 Bible scholars from all over the world, in fact, from over 100 con uh, countries, issued a statement that we want to share with you. It is our professional guild, and we stand by this statement, and it helps, I think, frame our response to the question that Liz just asked us. It's very short, and I'll begin, and, and Carla will just alternate. Mm -hmm. So this is from the Council of the Society of Biblical Literature and the executive staff of the Society of Biblical uh, Literature, and it begins this way. We are appalled at the murder of George Floyd on 25th May 2020 by police. We grieve the murder of Breonna Taylor and many others who have died because of anti-blackness. Carla? are committed to the clear and unequivocal assertion that black lives matter. We applaud the spirit of protest that has emerged around the world. And as a result, as a result of this heinous act, while lamenting the violence that has also broken out in pockets of uh, that otherwise peaceful and necessary protest. Black lives matter, the Bible matters. We protest the actions by the President of the United States, who on the evening of June 1st, 2020, called for military action against U.S. residents on U.S. soil, had peaceful protesters tear gassed out of his way, stood uninvited before an Episcopal parish and waved a Bible. We call out the president for abusing <clears throat> what is for many a treasured spiritual resource and symbol, and we deplore his violation of sacred space. We call out political leaders to engage the Bible in thoughtful and responsible ways. The Bible should not be brandished as a weapon to attack humanity or to violate the dignity of the human spirit. We commit to the work of studying and exposing how the Bible <clears throat> has been and continues to be used in this way. Black, Black lives matter. matter. We are grateful to our guild for issuing that statement. And in terms of what we mean by, when, uh, by interpreting the Bible, the, when we teach, when I teach, I'm concerned with bringing our personal mm -hmm. stories into intersection with the biblical story. The Bible matters in that it touches us, it forms us, it shapes us. And it can only do that if we immerse ourselves in it. The Bible cannot be used as a weapon. The Bible cannot be used as a rubber stamp for government. The Bible must be interpreted within community because it's no one's personal property. It is the symbol, it is the foundation of a community of faith and of the body of Christ. I just want to say as well, I you know, we, Denise and I have, uh, we do what we do because we love this text. And it's not just an ancient text for us, it's a sacred word. I, and whenever we're teaching our students, many of you, uh, tools of biblical interpretation, I, we also warn you uh, that this, this text has been uh, uh, used and abused uh, in, in horrible ways. Uh, throughout history, uh, throughout our church's history. And so when we're engaging in the act of trying to find out what this text might possibly mean, first in some sort of ancient context and then drawing implications for the church today, we know that this is a dangerous enterprise and it's not to be taken lightly. 
I, we believe that the Bible uh, is, uh, it points to the very word of God. Uh, and the Bible <clears throat> uh, should be uh, something that brings life, that challenges us, that surprises us. I, the Bible should be able to correct us. I, and so in our classes, and I, I know, um, you know some of you I've been in class with, and um, in our classes, we, we love to pause and read the Bible together and to study it. I, and uh, I, I tell you uh, that this is grueling and hard work. And the hardest thing you will do all semester is write that exegetical paper. And some of you look at me and you don't believe me at first. And now most of my graduates, like you all know, that's the hardest thing that you're going to do. This is hard work, but it's also rewarding work. I, I and I, I hopefully at this point, you all know some of those rewards uh, that are gained from this study. Uh, but in short, you're really, when you're studying this text, you are hoping that that biblical text comes to life. And when it does, it will challenge you. That's the difference between a seminary and a university setting. Uh, we don't read this text uh, just to try to figure out what an ancient text means. We read this text to try to figure out what the living word is speaking to us. And I think another difficult part of the interpretive enterprise is listening to what others see and in the text. What is it that they see because of the experiences they bring to the text? And uh, that is why the Bible needs to be read in community because there is no one way to read it. It is a multi-voice text. And I know it's a whole lot easier for us to say, this is what the Bible means, and we cannot do that. To do that is to violate the sacredness of this text and to encase the living word basically in a coffin. And it becomes a, a, an artifact, a dead thing. Um, and that's the last thing that we want to do. So I love that. Carla mentioned this notion of surprise, of challenge. Um, I like to talk in Phyllis Tribble's very ancient terms about the Bible containing prescriptive and descriptive texts, that there are prescriptions about the way we ought to live, um, and there are descriptions of the ugly ways in which we are actually living. So the Bible also can be used as a mirror that we can hold up to ourselves to indict ourselves, to challenge ourselves to do better. And certainly we need to hold it up not as a photo op, but as a challenge to our government to ask, are you listening to the voices that you are denying a place at the table for? We could uh, do another hour on biblical interpretation. I was about to say, we could easily just go on and on um, and, and, and about the importance of <clears throat> asking about other voices and what they say in the text, right? Because we can easily just recreate what white people have said <laughs> about a text. Um, and hold up our own interpretation as normative for everyone else, yeah. which we cannot do. We have to... We have to listen to one another. We have to embrace one another. Um, and sometimes that's, that's extremely difficult to do. Yeah. But Dr. Works and Dr. Hopkins. Oh, no, please yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. I see we do have no, another I question just for you. To say, we also have to listen for hidden voices within the text because the texts themselves are not unmediated. They have been shaped by people in particular times and places. So what about those voices that were muffled or that were shoved to the background? We have to develop really keen senses to look for those voices. Absolutely. Thank you. Roger. Thank you both. And we want to just remind you all that if you have a question, please uh, put it into the chat. Um, and after the second question, we're going to open the floor for other questions. Um, but our second question is, how does the Bible speak to us in our current situation beyond its ancient audiences? I think the Bible is a living word. 
You know, the Bible, um, to, to piggyback on something Denise just said, the Bible is a, a collection of a, a lot of people of faith mm -hmm. trying to grapple with what God is doing in their world. And they're doing it with the language that they have at their disposal. They're doing it through all of the limitations of human language to try to describe the greatness of God. Uh, and which is why the Bible resorts so often to story uh, because narrative can kind of help draw us in in ways that our own descriptive language struggles um, to, to figure out what God is doing and what God is saying. And the whole canon is uh, bearing witness to a creator God who absolutely refuses to abandon God's creation. So all of these words and these manuscripts are pointing to a word that is itself bigger than the text, to a word that challenges us, to a word that reveals God to us, to a, a, a word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, so it is a living text. God is still speaking in this text. You know, in class, um, I. I love it when we've done so much work in the text and we have uh, looked at the text in light of its ancient context and we've done the best we can to make that text come alive uh, for uh, some sense of what it might mean in its historical context. But then something else happens. The text comes alive in a new way uh, and we have encountered a living word that transforms what we thought we were doing. You know, we came in thinking, thinking that we were controlling the exercise. We came in with the fallacy of believing that we own the interpretive task. Mm -hmm. And then what we encountered was a living word that sort of grabbed us and and shook us by the shoulders. Uh, and we as a class in those moments were just transformed. Uh, and I, as a teacher, I sometimes call those aha moments because it's like I can see light bulbs going off, you know, all over the classroom and I'm addicted to those. I cannot program them in the syllabus. They're not mm -hmm. mine. I don't own them. Uh, and so many times, I find, I, you know, I'm sorry, I know several of you are, are preaching and teaching in churches, but so many times I don't have those moments in church because the sermon very often was created without the need for the biblical text. So we have a preacher who has decided what he or she wanted to say beforehand and then just uses the biblical text as some relish or flourish. Preach it, Carla. Preach it, Carla. <laughs> but what happens is when people encounter the word, that word is revelatory. Uh, and it's a revelation that is completely transformative. Mm -hmm. And when I ask my students to describe what just mm -hmm. happened, they struggle to come up with some sort of words. I, I struggle to come up with some sort of words. But our perspective has totally changed. Uh, the Bible is still speaking. And then we, I don't have to ask them to draw implications because then suddenly that word has challenged them to such a degree that they see their world differently. That's what we need to be striving for whenever we preach and we teach the text. But we don't get to program that. Uh, that's the work of the Holy Spirit uh, moving uh, in us and through us. We just, we just celebrated Pentecost. You know, mm -hmm. the spirit is on the loose. Uh, that word is a living word, and there's a lot of power there. Uh, if I can convince all of my students <laughs> to, to, uh, to, to use the Bible more, uh, the Bible points to that word. Uh, and there's so much power there for transformation. Uh, if we just start to believe that this text does have life-giving power. Uh, to point us to something that's bigger and, and greater than ourselves. Uh, because, my goodness, uh, we have proven again and again 
that we cannot do this on our own. We cannot transform the world on our own. This is an act of God and we need the word of God. So Carla, thank you for that. I, that is exactly why I have been teaching now going on 35 years this fall. Uh, I am the longest serving faculty member at Wesley and I am always excited to walk into intro class precisely for the reason you outlined. I will still see something new in a text that I've taught literally thousands of times before because the spirit has come into the room and really filled all of us. Mm -hmm. the same thing happened to me this week. I was reading um, a column by Sally Jenkins in the Washington Post sports section, because you all know I'm a Syracuse rah-rah, right? Um, and basketball and everything is at a standstill. Well, Sally Jenkins talked about uh, the knee that Colin Kaepernick took on the field and linked it to the knee of the white officer on George Floyd's neck in Minneapolis. And she said, those are two different kinds of knees that will lead our country in two different kinds of directions. But to Sally Jenkins' credit, she quoted Frederick Douglass. Mm. I was blown away by that. And the, the, uh, the quote that she used is this, poets, prophets, and reformers are all picture makers. And this ability is the secret of their power and of their achievements. They see what ought to be by the reflection of what is and endeavor to remove the contradiction. And I read that and suddenly all my light bulbs went off and I thought of, I've, I've been, I thought of Walter Brueggemann. Mm -hmm. I teach him every year. I still think he has the best statement on the two main tasks of a prophet. Number one, to criticize what is, and we know that the pre-exilic prophets were very good at that, yes? Amos and Hosea, Micah and uh, Jeremiah, yes? And to energize with an alternative vision of community. So how does this Bible speak to us today? Well, I teach the prophets, and basically what they did was take a knee. Mm did what Colin Kaepernick did. They took a knee. I mean, Jeremiah was banished to a pit and left to die for his message about the destruction of the temple. He took a knee, yes? And Colin Kaepernick's career went in the toilet because of the courage that he showed on the field, yes? And, and suddenly all those things congealed for me. Mm -hmm. I was so excited. So now, what do I have an intro for the fall? I've got a picture of Colin Kaepernick kneeling on the field, a picture of, of Frederick Douglass, and the quote from Walter Brueggemann about the two main tasks of a prophet. If that isn't showing how the Bible speaks to today, I don't know what is. Um, and often it speaks to indict us. Mm. And we have to accept that indictment and stop being defensive. To be all that God calls us to be, which is so much better than what we are now. So much better. Don't you think, Denise, though, that there is a, um, very often we, maybe it's because we are afraid of the staff parish relations committee, or maybe we're afraid of the people, or maybe, maybe it's that we love our church members so much and we don't want to offend them, that we protect them from the text. And in, and in the process of doing that, we lose the gospel uh, because we do not allow them to see God's new creation. We do not allow them to see God's shalom, right? Uh, and we, we need to do a better job of not protecting people from the text and let it indict all of us. I couldn't agree more, Paula, uh, Carla, I'm sorry. I just talked to a Paula friend on the phone before the seminar began. Um, Phil Wogeman, who used to teach ethics here, 
wrote a book called It's Time, to, uh, not a book, an article in, I forget the publication, it was called It's Time to Tell the Truth. And he said exactly what you said. We have to stop protecting our congregations. It is a form of paternalism when you think about it. Mm -hmm. It's a form of uh, treating them as infants. Somehow they can't handle this. And what questions do we get in intro all of the time? How can I go back to my congregation and teach what you're teaching? Yeah. And I always say, let the text do the talking yeah. for you. Yeah. Let the text do the talking. Notice where the gaps are. Notice how you're filling in the gaps of the text. And then ask, why are you filling in the gaps in that way? What if we filled in the gaps this way? Right. Therefore, the text is basically our kind of bulldozer. Uh, it's the advance guard that breaks through all of the defensiveness and uh, all of our um, assessments of who the congregation is, right? Because we're doing it together. Absolutely and positively. Now, it's kind of easy for us to say that because we have more freedom in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And when we go and guest preach in local churches, we slip in and we slip out, right? Um, so I'm saying that knowing that the fallout can be severe. Yeah. I, I heard Fleming Rutledge recently uh, talk about the reality that we, we don't often give our churches any sense of vision. You know, we, we give them a lot of to-do list. You ought to, and you are called to, and you should do this, and you should do that. And I've started labeling that Home Depot Christianity. You can do oh, that. Oh, I like that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we don't give them a vision. Like, th there is something really powerful about a revelation of what God is doing, right, I, that people want to get on board with. I, and the Bible has it. <laughs> the Bible has the goods. So how do we get people to preach and teach it? Um, and I think that it begins with becoming addicted to those moments where the word grabs you uh, and you know its power. And I think that needs to be followed up with some careful study. Um, again, I, re I refer to what you said earlier about using the Bible as a kind of jumping off place for a sermon and then leaving it behind. Mm -hmm. But if we're serious about bringing individual lives and stories in, an inter in intersection with the biblical story, then we have to take time to lead our congregations through the text. Absolutely. Uh, I saw one chat question from Jill Ann about, well, what's the difference between preaching and teaching? Mm -hmm. um, I would like to think there's a great element of preaching in teaching and a great element of preach, uh, teaching in preaching, yes? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a very fluid line there. Um, I think the topical sermon has been the death of that um, link. Uh, so I always challenge my students at least once a month, an exegetical sermon, once a month. Takes long. Yeah. Well, and when we fail to do that kind of hard work of studying the text and bringing up the context, we have made the Bible say anything we want it to say. Yes. I, we, are, we are very guilty of that. And proof texting, let's, let's have a shout out for proof texting and how that destroys the authority of the Bible uh, because it's totally rudderless anchorless interpretation. Yes, that we allow our politicians to do as well. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we time. do. And every single time that that happens, we ought to have a letter writing campaign in our local churches to write our mayor, our, uh, our US representative, our senator to say, do you realize what you just did with that text? Mm. Wouldn't that be good? The other thing I wanted to say is the Lewis Center uh, is if you all haven't signed up for the Lewis Center uh, newsletter, Leading Ideas, please do. Uh, Love at Weems will always um, have uh, some questions at the end of, uh, of a newsletter. And often the question will run like this. Let's review the programs the church is running. And here I'm, I'm talking about Carla's idea of Home Depot 
what did you call it? Home, Home Depot, Depot Christianity. Christianity, okay. You can do it, God can help. <laughs> yes, exactly, yes. And his question is always, how does what we're doing further the mission and the vision of the church? If it doesn't, why are we doing it? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, why are we doing it? Something as simple as that, right? Well, you two have offered um, a perfect segue to our next question. Um, how or what do you say about President Trump's use of the Bible this week in front of St. John's Episcopal Church? I'm almost speechless. Um, I mean, it's been said, Episcopal leader of the diocese, um, shock, uh, photo op, uh, I believe he was holding the Bible backwards as well. He was just holding it. And a reporter asked, is that your Bible? He said, it's a Bible. Um, it's, um, for me, it's akin to those churches that never consider why the American flag is in their sanctuaries. In my view of the founding fathers, uh, their notion of the separation of church and state was to enable the church to critique the state. Um, and in Trump holding up a Bible and waving it and saying, this is a great country, he allowed the Bible to become captive to the government's agenda. And I think that is a sin of a very large order. I agree. Um, I, don't, I don't want to cut you off if you had something else you wanted to add. I, I think, you know, for me personally, <laughs> it's real easy to critique what happened this week with Trump. Um, and it's real easy almost every week to say something um, and critique. I think, you know, it, it was obviously um, for many of us, I mean, religious leaders across the world weighed in on this. It wasn't just the Society of Biblical Literature and 8,000 uh, Bible professors. You, you had everyone from even you know leaders in in very conservative traditions uh, weighing in, asking politicians to take the Bible yes. seriously. Uh, it's easy to get infuriated uh, with this behavior, uh, but I think for me this week, the the most infuriating aspect of seeing the president of the United States wave a Bible at a protest that's just trying to bring attention to black lives mattering in our country. What was more infuriating is that it is, I, in my opinion, I, we should be asking, why would he think it's okay to do so? And the white church bears a lot of responsibility here. So it's really easy to point our finger at him. But for me, I think, uh, why do we have a president who thinks this is okay? Because historically white Christians have used the Bible as a tool of power to, to get their own way, to get their agenda. Uh, and this is, this is true for both political parties. Uh, we have historically voted for politicians who use the Bible. And, and sadly, even when they, they say 2 Corinthians instead of 2 Corinthians, uh, we have, you know, I can't imagine us uh, voting in a leader who regularly quotes from the Quran, even though we say that this country uh, believes in religious freedom. You know, to me, uh, what concerns me about the events of this week is that it's really easy for us 
to critique the president. But I think we need to take some ownership here, especially us that are, we are part of the white church. We are part of the white church tradition. We have got to ask, how did we allow this to happen? And we need to repent. I, and that's, that is a biblical response. Uh, we need to confess that we have not demanded better of our politicians. We have not uh, loved our neighbors, particularly our black neighbors as ourselves. We have not heard the cry of the needy and we need forgiveness. Uh, and I, it, I think it's really disturbing to me that so many of us are, are willing to latch on and uh, criticize the president, but we're not willing to ask the harder question of why is it that he ever thought this was okay in the first place? And we bear some responsibility in that. And only God can fix uh, what we have done, uh, this, all of the sins that we continue to perpetuate. Uh, but I, I hope that this will be a, a time where white believers will ask themselves, how did we allow this uh, to happen? And how can God, uh, hopefully God will come in and, and, and change our perspectives and change how we, um, how we think about our relationship to our nation, how we think about our relationship to our world, uh, because this should not happen. But it happened because there's a history here uh, that told this man that this would be a good idea. Uh, and so for me, uh, this has been uh, a week uh, marked with confession and, and, and real, we need real repentance uh, in the white church. Although I think uh, to talk about the white church as a monolith is something we also need to be careful of uh, because there have been parts of the white church um, that have railed against precisely what Trump has been doing. So um, certainly we all need to repent, but um, uh, I think some parts of the church probably need a little bit more repentance than others, if one can say that. Um, I also want to point out that the forcible removal of those protesters uh, involves some of our graduates, um, people that I have had in class. They were tear gassed. They were on the patio of St. John's Episcopal Church and tear gassed uh, without having offered any provocation whatsoever. Um, that is what scares me more than anything else. The use of force in service of the biblical photo opportunity. So again, using the Bible as divine warrant in the same way that King David used the, um, the presence of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem to perpetuate the excesses of the monarchy. Yes, we are doing, again, here's how the Bible speaks to today. What symbols are ensconced in our nation's capital um, that allow uh, the Bible to be used as a, rubber, as a divine rubber stamp? And as Carla said, we have to raise our voices and say, stop doing that. I do think we cannot be silent, but I also think I, we, it's easy for us to always put the blame on somebody else. And I think we have to be very cautious. Uh, depending on which church tradition you're in, each side blames the other. And I, so it's really interesting uh, to have, um, you know, to have people that I love and to myself, my own history, to have been in, in uh, both worlds. I, but I think, you know, now is the time for some serious introspection um, uh, to figure out where we have participated uh, in systems that privilege ourselves uh, and how we have benefited. Um, so I, I don't want to lose sight of that. I, I think yeah. we're, we're, it's easy for us to critique, but I think it's much harder for us to repent. I would agree with that, Carla. I certainly would. 
So we have time for one audience question. Thank you so much for having the most delightful and active chat box I've ever seen in a webinar. Um, everyone should <laughs> scroll through it. And keep up with it. <laughs> yeah, everyone should scroll through it because it is affirming and positive and wonderful. Um, so our one question from the chat box that we're going to end here with, so you only have about four minutes to address this question, um, but it, it definitely relates to how we can reflect and, and remember our, um, it, how we can reflect uh, when we're looking at the Bible. So this person's question is, how do we take our exegesis and what is happening in the world and make sure we aren't making the text do what we want it to? How do we check ourselves? Good question. Well, part of how we check ourselves beyond just the, you know, the reality that we need to do research. I mean, we, you've, most of you have been in our classes now, you know, we, we have beat you over the head with the need to, to read these texts and consider them in light of their historical, social, and cultural context. But one thing we haven't really touched on is that this, I mean, to me, as a person of faith, this exegetical task is not a solo one, right? I, this text is a, a sacred text, and it's best interpreted in community. I, and one thing that always happens every year, and I think Denise would agree with this as well, I, is that when we're looking at a text in class, I mean, Denise and I have been reading these texts. You know, we, we study these texts. We've given our lives to these texts. We grapple with these texts. You know, these texts have scarred us personally. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and we're reading them in community. And, and because you all represent so many different communities, you see something in the text that we don't see. And you ask questions that cause us to wonder, hmm, you know, why do I think this about the text? Um, uh, and, and there's so many ways in which that text comes alive and challenges our notions and preconceptions. I, I have a, a weird um, pedigree uh, with my theological education in that I started off in a Southern Baptist seminary. And that seminary, I, the uh, goal of your New Testament class was to tell you the correct interpretation of the biblical text, not to give you tools to think about the text, and certainly not to read it in community. And any interpretation that deviated from the norm was considered heretical. And any interpreter who deviated from the norm was considered heretical. Uh, so I, you know, there, there is humility needed in interpreting the text. There's the reality that our lenses, because of the gigantic sin problem in our world, the, the power of sin that, as Paul says, dominates our whole uh, world and our lenses, uh, we are not immune from that and we need to recognize that we bring things to the text and sometimes we bring things to, to the text that hinder us from actually reading the text i uh, you know we're just we're mad at how a text has been used throughout history and and we're mad legitimately but that anger can also prevent us uh, from going to the text so beyond study uh, beyond, you know, purposely seeking out voices that are different from ours, mm -hmm. we also need to be reading and, and interpreting these texts inside of sacred communities that also help hold us accountable in ways that we cannot even anticipate. Uh, but you have to create a space in which those voices are welcome. And I would add, uh, again, something that William Brown said, and that is, any exegesis of the text involves an exegesis of the self. So I think we need to model uh, what exegeting oneself might look like if we're talking about approaching with humility. That means to be very clear about our context and our biases. And again, I go back to the fact 
that the biblical text has gaps in it. it. There are things it does not say. And when we fill in those gaps, we need to be conscious of why we are filling them in in the way that we are. And we need to realize also in community that other people are filling in those gaps according to how experience has shaped them. And uh, the tension in that, someone in the chat room talked about tension, you know that's my favorite word when I talk about biblical interpretation, tension. The tension is to see the different possibilities of the gap filling. And as my former colleague Sharon Rinke used to say, um, realize when you're filling in the gaps and it hurts other people. That is a very important recognition. Oh, I'm gonna fill in the text gap this way. Ah, but it's going to hurt my neighbor. Um, so there's a, a modeling that we need to do as preachers and teachers in terms of some transparency, uh, in terms of some self-analysis, um, and in terms of humility. Right. Always look for the anchor in the text to hang your interpretation on. If it's not there, you are just blowing smoke. That reminds me of a quote that I put on my syllabus every semester. So my students, if you've read the syllabus, you've seen the quote. <laughs> but in the event that it has been a few years since you took my class, I put a quote on there by St. Augustine. Those who think they have understood the divine scriptures or any part of them, but cannot by their understanding build up the twofold love of God and of neighbor have not yet succeeded in understanding them. Mm -hmm. a, a, a great quote. Uh, perhaps uh, that's a, a good note to, uh, for me to end on. <laughs> That is the perfect note to end on. That is all the time that we have tonight <laughs> for questions. Um, thank you both so much. I, and if you are a prospective student on this call, Elijah and I will be reaching out to you with a follow-up email tomorrow. If you're a current student or an alum, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And please encourage friends, families, uh, family members, and colleagues who have a call to ministry to explore Wesley. It's a great place with great faculty. Um, and great people, as we all see tonight. We are still accepting applications for fall 2020 until August 1st. And now I'm going to throw it over to Elijah to, uh, to, to give us a, a word of benediction. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Thank you, Dr. Works. Um, so I was sharing with Liz that, you know, as, as many of us know, this has been just a very emotionally trying week. Um, as we were speaking, I just started spiraling and I shared that privately. Um, but it, w it was in a way of, of appreciation for the ways, in the ways in which you, the two of you have continually um, pushed us to expand, pushed us to look at different lenses, um, and the way that God has used both of you to touch many of our lives. Um, in light of, of the events that have been taking place and continue to take place, um, a scriptural reference I wanted to share um, comes from Galatians 6.2 where it says, Cather, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Um, and and um, through Wesley, everyone who's gathered here, all the ways that we are ministering, all the ways that we are taught, all the ways that we are teaching and sharing, um, that's what we're doing, you know, and, and in, our, in our lives, that's what we should continue to do. And I'm just thankful for everyone that's here. Um, once again, for you, Dr. Hopkins and Dr. Works, um, and I'd like to close us in a moment of prayer. Um, so if you would all join me in a posture that is most um, comfortable for you. Um, Creator, Holy God, we thank you for this space and opportunity. We thank you for these two souls, um, Denise and Carla, who have committed their lives to unpacking the text, who have committed their lives to sharing the word with others, who have committed their lives to hearing the voices of all people in, in the Bible um, and sharing with generations to continue to do so. We thank you for every soul who is here, who continues to fight for justice, who has committed their lives to standing in solidarity with those who are oppressed in all the ways that oppression manifests itself. And we thank you for souls who are committed to fighting against um, workers of iniquity and wickedness in this world. As we go forth, may we continue to fight the good fight. May we be blessed by your Holy Spirit to have energy that surpasses um, natural capability, Lord, but let us be blessed with a um, energy that is supernatural. Help us to continue to 
walk in the ways you are calling us. Help us to continue to stand up in the places where we are most fearful. And God, we thank you um, again for this space. We look forward to many more conversations and many more fights of justice. Um, in the name of Jesus, we do pray and say thank you, God. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Go in peace. Have a good night.